winter time. It can be a season of beauty and fun. But winter is also the season of sniffles, coughs, runny noses, body aches, and fevers. Every year from October to May, the common cold and influenza infect millions throughout the United States. If you think the cold and flu season is bad with one kid, you should try it with four. While the common cold is a nuisance, influenza can be deadly, responsible for 20,000 deaths per year. I went from a 36-year-old woman who was so active to somebody who was going to die. I'm Kat Carney, and for the next hour, we'll journey through the world of sneezing, coughing, and runny noses, and learn how to stay healthy during the height of cold and flu season. We've all suffered a cold and flu. The culprit? A virus. A microscopic body invader whose sole purpose is to infect our upper respiratory tract, multiply, and spread. The virus enters our body through our mouths, eyes, and most typically, our noses. Here, hair-like cilia in the nasal passage carry it to the back of the throat. There, it invades our cells and uses them to multiply. As the virus multiplies, it attracts white blood cells which release chemicals that cause the well-known aggravating symptoms. The runny nose, <coughs> the coughing, <coughs> the sneezing. This is how our bodies expel the virus, but it's also how the virus spreads. The virus shoots through the air, carried by tiny droplets of saliva. It's on the loose, prowling for a new host. Once the virus invades a new victim, it's off to schools, shopping malls, and offices, possibly infecting hundreds of people in the course of a day. Unlike other, more deadly viruses like malaria, encephalitis, and HIV, cold and flu viruses can live in the air, which makes their transmission much easier. I'm here with Dr. Kimberly Chapin of the Leahy Clinic in Boston, and we're on the hunt for cold and flu viruses. Viruses can live on surfaces for up to six hours, and so it is possible to get respiratory viruses from inanimate objects such as the phone or the ATM. Dr. Chapin swabs common surfaces in the hopes of collecting virus samples. She swabs elevator buttons, doorknobs and handles, even money. Virtually everything we touch could harbor a cold or flu virus. Today, we came up clean. The good thing is, is that when we cultured for the viruses, we didn't actually find anything from any of the places we cultured. So if there had been a virus present, how would I have contracted the virus? Actually, the way you get most viruses is by direct contact. Uh, the virus has to be able to attack the cell that it's going to infect. So the best way is actually sort of hand to eye or hand to nose or hand to mouth where it actually gets on the mucous membrane where it's going to attack. This is an influenza virus. This is the most common cold virus, the rhinovirus. And this is another cold virus. No matter where you go or what you do, these viruses are almost impossible to avoid. Adults average two to four colds per year. But children get colds much more often. Colds are the leading cause for visits to the pediatrician's office. And um, an average, a, a child has, on an average, seven to 10 colds during the months of September, probably through April. 
Schools and daycare centers are breeding grounds for colds and flu. Children are in close quarters and don't wash up as often as they should. One study found that children who washed their hands four or more times per day missed 24% fewer school days as a result of colds and flu. If you have kids, you know that cold and flu season can be a nightmare. So what is it if you have quadruplets? Quadruple nightmare? <laughs> it's ongoing. It's just ongoing. One gets sick, the next gets sick, and it takes place over the course of time. It's not like everyone has the sense to get sick at the same time. So it's exhausting. The periquads, Connor, Rachel, Megan, and Ben, came along in 1996. And as you might imagine, with quadruplets, everything comes in fours. Four times the clothes, four times the food, four times the toys, and unfortunately, four times the number of colds and flus. Chris and Karen's rambunctious quad squad has certainly had their share. About a month ago, Connor's nose started to run, then he started coughing, so I brought him to the doctor, but he didn't have a fever, so there's no way to treat it. Brought him home, Rachel's nose started running, same thing, brought her to the doctor, no fever, can't do anything. Um, about another week later, he's still coughing. Now I've got two coughing, now the third one's coming down with it. Another week, four weeks into it, they're still coughing, now the fourth one's coming down with it, and Chris and I have sinus infections at the same time. It's a circus. Hi guys, we're ready for you. Come on in. Dr. Beth Frere is a pediatrician who specializes in treating multiples. The periquads are frequent visitors. When you have more than one child in the household, it's very hard to prevent the spread of colds and flus from one child to another, primarily because everybody is touching everybody's toys and touching each other and sharing cups and sharing spoons. If your child does come down with a cold or flu, over-the-counter medications usually come in a children's preparation. As with adults, the best medications for symptom relief are cough suppressants or expectorants for a persistent cough, decongestants for a stuffy nose, and acetaminophen or ibuprofen for fever reduction and pain relief. A lot of these over-the-counter remedies should be reserved for nighttime when sleeping is important and comfort while sleeping is important. And during the day, a child can run around with a runny nose and with a cough, et cetera, and still be absolutely fine, and there's no need to overuse over-the-counter preparations. Doctors caution against the use of aspirin if a child is suffering with a cold or flu. Aspirin appears to greatly increase the risk of Rye syndrome, a condition that leads to brain swelling and fatty deposits in the liver. It most commonly affects children between the ages of 3 and 12. For infants, saline nasal drops and suction with a bulb syringe can help keep the nasal passages clear. Doctors also advise the use of a cool mist vaporizer at night. Usually, these viral illnesses run their course in seven to 10 days and are no cause for alarm. But there are some definite warning signs that a visit to the pediatrician might be in order. High fever, if your child is not eating or drinking, or if she's having trouble breathing. Ear infections can sometimes accompany colds as well, and if a child's complaining of a sore ear, they should be seen also to rule out that possibility. But we always point out to the parent that it's very important to be patient with these colds because they can, in fact, last quite a while. The periquads appear to be finally on the mend. But for Karen, this most recent battle with pesky cold and flu viruses is still fresh on her mind. I feel like I've been through the war because no one's sleeping, or there's just all, all sorts of secretions all over the place. It's, um, it's unbelievable. You think the cold and flu season is bad with one kid, you should try it with four. We've conquered polio. We've eliminated smallpox. We've even made inroads against some forms of cancer and heart disease. But curing the common cold remains a holy grail of modern medicine. 
and the search is far from glamorous. Well, our research gets us into interesting things, uh, including nasal mucus, which uh, most people don't think about very much, uh, into putting a finger in the nose, uh, which we Americans call nose picking. The British are more polite, they say probing the nose. So that's all part of studying the common cold, and uh, these things are all important parts of understanding what's going on. For more than 30 years, Dr. Jack Waltney at the University of Virginia Medical Center has been on a quest to cure the common cold. The problem is there are over 200 varieties of cold viruses, making it difficult to develop an effective vaccine. This is a rhinovirus. It is responsible for 30 to 35 percent of common cold infections in the world. Once a virus like this reaches the back of the throat and invades healthy cells, a whole host of trouble begins. The sneeze, like many cold symptoms, is our body's way of expelling disease organisms from our mucous membranes. This is true of a runny nose, as well as a cough. But with coughing in particular, we also might be doing the virus a favor. <laughs> Lots of times with a cough, you re it's really more of a dry cough, and under those circumstances, uh, you may be helping to spread the virus out into the environment where somebody else may catch it. In 1986, cold researchers at the University of Wisconsin proved just that. You can catch a cold from breathing contaminated air. The researchers brought together a group of avid card players for a 12-hour round of poker. A third of the players were purposefully infected with a cold virus. The uninfected players were then equipped with rigid braces on their arms, preventing them from touching their nose or face. They too became sick, proving that the virus can spread in the air. The latest hope for a cold cure comes on the heels of a groundbreaking discovery. Researchers have finally identified the exact receptor the cold virus targets on the cells in our nose. It's called ICAM-1, and drug companies are trying to capitalize on its discovery to develop new cold treatments. The idea is if you put a large amount of synthetic receptor in the nose, as a decoy, when the virus gets there, it'll attach to this material that you've introduced into your nose and will never reach the eye cam that's on your cells. Already, one experimental drug in clinical trials has shown significant reduction in the severity of cold symptoms and in the duration of illness. If these new drugs are successful, the common cold may soon be a thing of the past. In 1918, the world learned just how quickly a dangerous virus could spread. An international influenza epidemic, or pandemic, traversed the globe and killed as many as 20 million people worldwide. More Americans died from the 1918 flu than were killed in World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War combined. The 1918 uh, flu was the, the grandfather of all influenza viruses. There's never been a known pandemic of flu that caused this amount of, of mortality. Known as the Spanish flu, the first recorded case occurred on March 4, 1918, in Camp Funston, Kansas. Camp Funston was the largest containment or mobilization center in the United States for World War I. We had uh, 60,000 troops come in from all over the country. Included among those was a young mess cook by the name of Albert Gitchell, who was an Iowa farm boy. He was the first one to complain of chills and fever, and the first recorded case of the flu. Gitchell survived, but he had already passed the flu on to countless others. 1,000 soldiers landed in the infirmary, 
46 died. The 1918 pandemic had begun. World War I was in full swing. And unknowingly, America shipped thousands of infected soldiers across the Atlantic. The virus landed in Europe, where dramatic change made it even more deadly. Something happened in the fall, and presumably a mutation in the virus that made it super lethal. It just literally exploded almost overnight. Influenza is a highly contagious respiratory tract infection. Typical symptoms include sneezing, coughing, sudden fever, body aches, and a feeling of general weakness. It can lead to 20,000 deaths in the United States each year. But in 1918, death rates were much higher and the victims weren't the flu's usual targets. Most influenza viruses affect uh, newborn infants and the elderly, and young healthy adults are usually pretty immune to the effects of the flu. In this case, young healthy adults, 20 to 40 year olds, were killed selectively by this virus. And the reasons for that are entirely unknown. In a ghastly death, young soldiers drowned in their own fluids and blood in just four days. These people would turn blue, they would get cyanotic because they were not able to uh, get oxygen into their body through their lungs because their lungs were just being completely filled with blood or fluid. So they would turn blue, they would get necrosis of the tips of their fingers uh, and toes, they would turn black, get gangrene if they lived long enough. Uh, it was unbelievable. The war ended in November of 1918, but not the pandemic. The flu had invaded every aspect of life. Masks were donned in a futile attempt to prevent infection. Funerals with more than 10 mourners were outlawed. Across the country, coffin makers and grave diggers couldn't keep up with the demand. In just 18 months, nearly every person in the world was exposed. With everyone either dead or immune, there were no new victims to infect. The virus simply died out disappearing without a trace. There are those who believe that a lethal influenza virus could be a disaster of global proportions. It's a natural disease that changes every year, and if it changes significantly to the point that we don't have a good vaccine to control it, um, that would be an international public health emergency. To help avoid a present-day influenza outbreak, scientists are trying to discover what made the 1918 flu so lethal. I think that the answer to the virulence of the virus is in its uh, genes. I personally think that, that the answer will be found by sequencing the virus and analyzing it. Scientists like Jeffrey Taubenberger must first find a sample of the 82-year-old killer. This is an armed forces archive in Forest Glen, Maryland, but it doesn't house documents. It houses body parts. This unassuming warehouse contains specimens from military autopsies performed all the way back to the Civil War. There are samples of every part of the human body, hearts, lungs, bones, and more. In the 1990s, scientists began combing through the 95 million samples in the hope that somewhere buried deep within these stacks, a sample of the 1918 flu might still exist. When we started to investigate the project of the Spanish influenza, we, we realized that the AFIP in its archives had about 70 cases in which tissues had been preserved from victims of the 1918 flu. But even if the tissue does contain the virus, chances are that 82 years in formaldehyde had damaged it. But finally, Taubenberger hits pay dirt. In the lung tissue of a 21-year-old soldier, he comes face to face with an influenza virus that matches no other known virus. Taubenberger has found the killer of 20 million people.
New, potentially dangerous strains of flu generally start with animals. Influenza virus can pass from species to species. The three major groups of animals are humans, swine, and birds. And among the birds, it's particularly ducks and chickens. Some experts theorize that the 1918 flu was so deadly because it started in a bird. Usually, bird flus cannot infect humans. But when they occasionally do, it's a surprise attack on an immune system totally unprepared for the invasion. Another theory is that the 1918 flu was a supercharged swine or pig flu. Pigs act as a mixing vessel. They can catch flus from other animals, birds, other pigs, even humans. When different flus infect the same cell at the same time, the loosely structured genetic material can mix together, creating new influenza strains that can infect people. Most new human flus start in Asia because the three main carriers, humans, chickens, and pigs, often live in proximity to one another. In Asia, it is common to keep uh, uh, ducks and chickens alive in the market until they're sold to people. So there's dense concentrations of these birds. The birds exchanging viruses with each other, the birds passing viruses into the uh, swine, human viruses re-entering the swine population, admixture occurring, new viruses emerging, and then coming into the human population. Back in Dr. Jeffrey Taubenberger's laboratory, scientists create a family tree of 30 known flus based on the similarity of their gene sequence. When they compare sequences of the 1918 virus to the viruses on the tree, they make an important discovery. The 1918 flu is not an avian flu. Instead, it falls within the swine family the group of viruses that commonly attack humans. Miraculously, in 1997, Dr. Johann Hulten exhumed the body of a woman who died from the 1918 flu from the Alaskan permafrost. A sample of her lung tissue contained the virus and confirmed Taubenberger's findings. She, too, was infected with an influenza virus from the swine family. Genetic analysis is ongoing, but scientists know that somewhere lurking in these pens might be the virus that begins the next pandemic. Just imagine a modern pandemic where half the nation's police officers are out of work, sick with the flu. Half our firefighters are out of commission. And the number of available emergency room doctors is cut in half at exactly the moment when we need them the most. The potential is there. Uh, and I, you know, I think it's safe to say it's not a matter of if it's happening, but a matter of when it'll happen. Our first line of defense, even in non-pandemic years, is influenza immunization. Prevention of flu depends entirely on getting vaccinated. And getting vaccinated in time, which means uh, usually in the late fall, before the flu season begins around the holidays. Flu viruses mutate so rapidly and so often, the vaccine has to be constantly updated to target the current strains. Flu predictably changes every year. It evolves more rapidly than any other virus. It changes its coat so the body's immune system cells don't recognize it as being the virus they encountered the year before. In fact, it is a new virus. Every year, flu trackers at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the World Health Organization try to predict which strains of influenza will be most prevalent when the next flu season begins. Based on their forecast, work begins on the following year's flu vaccine. These lab technicians aren't making omelets. 
they're making the latest batch of flu vaccine. Flu vaccine is manufactured from highly purified egg-grown flu viruses that have been genetically altered to be non-infectious. The vaccine does not have live flu virus in it, the present vaccine. It's inactivated, it's inert, it's a very safe vaccine, and uh, we have a constant foot race with, with the virus as it emerges in nature and trying to keep ahead of it. It's a 10-month process. Each January, the FDA provides vaccine manufacturers with seed virus, which is then injected into fertilized chicken eggs. The eggs are incubated to allow the virus to multiply and grow. In June, scientists harvest the virus and the FDA tests the strains to make sure they are potent enough for adequate immunization. In July, several strains are combined into one vaccine and filled into vials and syringes. In August, the FDA licenses the vaccine. And finally, in October, the vaccinations begin. Influenza immunization is recommended for anyone who wants to reduce their risk of catching the flu. Experts agree, however, that it is particularly crucial for people in several at-risk groups, including people over 50 years of age or residents of long-term care facilities, people with chronic medical conditions, and women who will be more than three months pregnant during the flu season. The flu shot is not advised for infants younger than six months. People who are allergic to eggs or who have had an allergic reaction to a previous influenza vaccine. Or people who have had a history of Guillain-Barre syndrome, a neurological disorder. One hopes for a time when we won't have any influenza. I think that day is a long way away. The best we can hope to do is to get vaccines which are perhaps even better than the ones we have now, which are pretty good. And it's theoretically possible that with a mass immunization campaign, you could actually drive the virus out before it has a chance to interact with animal virus genes, capture them, and start all over again. Pretty day, isn't it? 17 years ago, Millie Felchi was fighting an ordinary bout of influenza. But Millie has a genetic disorder known as alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Her blood lacks protective enzymes that would normally keep her lungs functioning properly. As a result, her flu spiraled into a devastating attack of pneumonia. Millie's lungs withered to just 17% of their volume. With alpha-1 antitrypsin, because we have no immune system, because of the um, deficiency, um, the infections attack our, our lungs, and we have nothing to fight it off. With us, um, pneumonias or flus can be fatal. Millie's doctors informed her that she had six months to live. They told me that there was nothing they could do for me, that the severity of the damage was so severe, that um, I was prepared to go home and die. Pneumonia is the most serious complication of influenza. It usually occurs when a disease organism travels down the windpipe and into the lungs. Here, small air sacs fill with fluid and white blood cells, making it harder for oxygen to pass into the bloodstream. Symptoms include fever, cough, sputum, and shortness of breath. The worst case, of course, is death. And um, the virus itself, influenza, can cause a severe pneumonia causing death. Uh, more commonly, it predisposes to bacterial infection. People can become very sick very quickly. The bacteria can get into the blood, uh, and you can die in a matter of a couple of days. Some years, there are as many as 5.1 million cases of pneumonia in the United States, resulting in up to 90,000 deaths. Anybody can contract pneumonia, 
but it is particularly dangerous for the elderly, the very young, and people with chronic medical conditions like Millie Felci. Over the past 17 years, Millie has battled almost a dozen pneumonia infections, each landing her in the hospital. Each time, she prepared for the worst. My husband, when he took me into the hospital, he'd say to my son, well, maybe mommy won't come home this time. You know, I don't know if mommy will come home this time. Um, and I made plans not to sometimes. I, I, I just felt that this was, I wasn't going to get better. Until 1950, contracting pneumonia often proved to be a death sentence. Luckily, modern medicine has advanced significantly in 50 years. In 1977, a pneumonia vaccine was developed. It has been found to be effective in approximately 80% of its recipients. Doctors recommend the vaccine to anyone who is prone to lung infections, including the following high-risk groups. People over the age of 65. Adults with chronic diseases of the lungs, heart, liver, or kidneys. Adults with diabetes, alcoholism, or cirrhosis. People over age two with sickle cell anemia, HIV infections, or those who have had their spleens removed. In addition to the vaccine, doctors like Michael Worthington now have an arsenal of antibiotics at their disposal. The antibiotics are extremely effective at killing the bacteria. The damage that's been done may take longer to resolve. Millie now exercises four times a week and makes sure to get her annual influenza vaccine. With the help of a new alpha-1 drug called prolastin, her lung volume has increased from just 17% in 1984 to a more manageable 35% today. I am a miracle. I mean, the doctors in town for many years told me I was their miracle patient. Um, they never saw a patient come come out of it so well. It's a high risk, a very high risk for me. I don't want to get pneumonia again. I don't want to get the flu. But, you know, I can't live in a glass house either. Uh, I enjoy life to the fullest. I, I do have a lot of confidence that I can beat anything. Colds and flu are both viruses that cause respiratory infections, but there are some significant differences. Influenza symptoms are generally more severe and incapacitating, and the flu virus tends to affect a greater portion of the respiratory tract, including the upper airway and lungs. Luckily, whether you have a cold or the flu, you can find relief at your local drugstore. Decongestants are the mainstay of cold and flu treatment. They cause blood vessels to constrict, which leads to reduced swelling and mucus production in the nose and sinuses. Cough suppressants are effective in combating dry, hacking coughs. They have a sedative effect on the area of the brain that controls the cough reflex. Cough expectorants help to loosen and expel mucus from the lungs. Analgesics like ibuprofen, acetaminophen, and aspirin are recommended if you need to lower fever and relieve muscle ache, pain, or headache. Local anesthetics, which come in the form of a lozenge or spray, help provide relief for a sore or scratchy throat. When it comes to multi-symptom formulas, remember that for cold and flu relief, Sometimes less is more. Unfortunately, sometimes patients are treating symptoms that they really don't have. For instance, some of the preparations contain decongestants, um, analgesics, expectorants, antihistamines, and cough suppressants all in one tablet when a patient may just have congestion and do fine just taking a plain old decongestion. 
If you're looking for an alternative to traditional over-the-counter remedies, there are many herbal cold and flu fighters available. Hi, Hi. Jeff. Welcome to Harnett's. I'm Thank Jeff Dorsey. You. Nice to meet you. Echinacea root is by far the most popular alternative remedy for cold and flu relief. Herbalists believe that echinacea increases white blood cell production and boosts overall immunity. Astragalus root, a member of the pea family, is thought to increase nearly every phase of immune system activity. And golden seal root is reported to help ease chronic inflammation of the mucous membranes. There's also elderberry for sinus relief and temperature reduction, and garlic, which contains allicin, a natural antibiotic thought to destroy viruses and foreign bacteria. Well, I've got everything I need. Let's check you out. OK. Herbal remedies could prove to be another important weapon in your arsenal against the winter onslaught of colds and flu. Genetically, viruses have an evolutionary advantage over humans because they reproduce and mutate much more quickly. Some researchers believe that this advantage is insurmountable and our fight against viruses will never end in complete victory. But at Amherst College, Professor Paul Ewald perhaps the world's leading expert on how infectious diseases evolve, believes otherwise. He thinks humans can exploit a virus's quick reproductive abilities and actually use them to tame it. We shouldn't be blind to the possible influence of our activities on the evolution of viruses, especially because that evolution is going at hyperspeed, essentially. These disease organisms can evolve substantial changes in periods of weeks. Ewald believes that we can control these changes simply by behaving differently when we are infected. For flu, his prescription is surprisingly simple. If you're sick, don't leave the house. If instead of having this kind of macho attitude, you're going to come to work even if you feel sick, we had a different attitude, which was, if you feel sick, stay at home. If we had that attitude instead of the macho attitude, then any disease organism that made us feel even the least bit sick would be taken out of the competition. Every autumn, several flu strains spread from person to person, from country to country, from continent to continent. But at some point during a flu outbreak, if the people who are feeling the worst, who are infected by the strongest strains, isolate themselves, the chain reaction stops. Strains that do us the most harm die off immediately. The flu that is left behind is harmless. You could say that it has been tamed or domesticated. One thing we've done with almost all the organisms that we've been living with is domesticate them. We've taken wolves, which were a threat to us, and altered their evolution to generate dogs. So the point is that we do this to almost all the organisms we live with, and we should be able to do it to disease organisms as well. It took thousands of years for man to tame wolves. But because flu viruses evolve so quickly, humans may be able to domesticate them in a matter of years. And if we can do that, then we can think of uh, changing disease organisms from those that cause us to be ill to disease organisms that are no longer causing disease. For Ewald, it's clear that evolutionary principles should be at the forefront of medical research. If he is right, by changing our behavior toward disease organisms even as deadly as malaria, Ebola, and HIV, we could free humanity of the ravages of these microscopic menaces. All we have to do is look at history to realize that evolution has been occurring um, throughout the 20th century in these disease organisms. It's very easy to see that disease organisms have been evolving in response to our activities. 
This is not just pie in the sky thinking. It's definitely uh, very real and it's based on the soundest of biological principles. For the McDonald's, winter can be a wonderland, but it can also be a season of terrifying anxiety. Stephen Leslie's oldest daughter, Lauren, suffers from a severe case of febrile or fever-related seizures. The slightest cold or flu can cause her temperature to spike dramatically, resulting in a frightening, convulsive seizure. She would go from no fever at all to 104, to 105, which for Lauren's body, she just couldn't handle her body temperature rising that quickly. It's extremely scary. You've got this beautiful child who, up until this point, has been developing completely normally according to all the doctor's well visits, and all of a sudden you see your child just drop to the floor and, and go into that seizure mode with the eyes rolling back in the head and turning that pale color with the lips turning blue and this very thick foam coming out of their mouth. Febrile seizures affect up to 5% of children, most often during the first two years of life. They usually last two to four minutes. Most children who suffer from febrile seizures have one or two before outgrowing them. Lauren has had no such luck. She's had nine. The first seizure Lauren ever had, she was just almost four, a little bit over 14 months old. In the middle of the night, I heard this moaning and groaning coming through the baby monitors. So I went into her room, and I looked in her crib, and she was just laying in the crib, totally lethargic. So we picked her up, called 911, and they took her to Haswell Children's Hospital. And what they told us at that point was that she had had a convulsion. The following evening, Lauren was walking through the family room, and she just collapsed on the floor and started having the seizure. So there's never any warning signs with her. No, there isn't. Her. No, there isn't. Our movements begin in the brain. Here, neurons communicate using electrical and chemical impulses. During a seizure, a trigger such as fever causes an electrical storm, overloading brain impulses and causing neurons to go haywire. The resulting seizure causes an immediate flurry of nervous system activity, which can result in abnormal movements of the limbs, interrupted breathing, and even a loss of consciousness. Most parents believe their child has died or is about to die, and in fact, that's very unusual. Dr. William Brown at the Hasbro Children's Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island, is Lauren's pediatric neurologist. He quickly calmed the McDonald's worst fears. The usual reason that a child does die during a seizure is because they drown in the bathtub or they fall out of a tree. The seizure doesn't cause brain damage. Uh, it's not painful to the child. They won't remember it in the morning. So what I usually tell people is that it looks a lot worse than it is. If a febrile seizure lasts more than three to four minutes, doctors recommend calling an ambulance. The most important thing to do if a child has a seizure in front of you is not to panic. Most febrile seizures are over within 30 to 40 seconds, um, but 30 to 40 seconds may seem like hours to a parent who's never seen one before. The best way to prevent febrile seizures is to minimize the risk of fever. Acetaminophen and ibuprofen usually work well. Sponging the child down in a tepid bath also can help reduce the high body temperature. Due to the alarming frequency of Lauren's seizures, Dr. Brown prescribed an anti-seizure medication called phenobarbital. Luckily, the McDonald's worries may soon be over. Lauren has been seizure-free for over a year. Two more months without a seizure and she can stop taking the medication. For Lauren, we're really seeing the light at the end of the tunnel for her, that this is something we, as a family, and Lauren can put behind us. And um, I think once we see Dr. Brown in March and he gives us that good news about taking her off the medication, that would probably be the best news that we could hear for Lauren.
feed a fever, starve a cold is just one of the many cold and flu myths we've all heard over the years. But it turns out it's not all wrong. Feed a fever has some truth to it, but most experts agree that you should never starve a cold. You need all the energy you can get to fight off infection. Oh, that looks delicious. Thank you. So what's Very better much. than Enjoy chicken that. soup? Thank you. Well, now, I heard that chicken soup cures a cold. Is that true? Well, yes and no. When I was a kid, I got grandma soup, and supposedly it was supposed to make my cold go away. And then, of course, very important researchers said, well, that's ridiculous. Chicken soup doesn't do anything for you. But they're wrong. Chicken soup does do something for you. As a matter of fact, it controls some of the effects of your white blood cells. And your white, white blood cells, cells help you fight infection but at the same time release chemical substances in your body that lead to congestion and other annoying cold and flu symptoms. So it doesn't end the cold, it doesn't prevent you from getting the cold, but while you have it, it makes you feel a little better, just like your grandma. Now, Marsha, if I had walked out here, because it's really cold, if I had walked out here without a coat, would that have given me cold or flu? In order to get the cold or to get the flu, you have to be exposed to the virus. That virus has to enter your nose, enter your mouth, get into the back of your throat to get the cold. And you cannot have it, no matter how cold you get, you cannot get the flu or a cold just by being cold. Wow, so that's just a myth. It is a myth. All right, Marsha, vitamin C. Now that cures a cold, right? No, it doesn't. The only thing that we've found out about vitamin C is that if you take it in very large doses, it might just encourage your immune system to work better. But it won't stop you from getting a cold, and the cold's going to run its course with the vitamin C or not. Thank mm. you. The hot alcohol toddy. Might not cure a cold, but I'll be feeling no pain after this. Well, for a while you won't be feeling any pain, but you know there's a flip side to alcohol and colds. Alcohol can really depress your immunity, and you need those white cells to fight off that infection. And the other thing that's a problem with alcohol is it dehydrates you, and you've already lost a lot of fluid through blowing your nose and having a fever, and therefore you really ought to be off alcohol altogether while you're sick. Well, but a sip can't hurt, can it? Sip can't hurt. To your health. Thank you. Each year, millions of Americans become ill from cold and flu viruses. But even with today's medical advances, we still don't have a cure. While scientists continue their quest, over-the-counter drug remedies, annual immunizations, and simply washing your hands remain our best methods for surviving the sniffling, sneezing, and coughing that burden us all during cold and flu season. <coughs> I'm Kat Carney. Stay healthy. <coughs>